All right, let's look at some simple and effective tips and tricks you can implement in your shading workflow that will help you take your materials to the next level. So let's go. By the way, this video is sponsored by Squarespace, but we'll talk more about them later in the video. For now, let's begin the video by firstly talking a little bit about the new and upcoming update to the principal BSDF node and the fixes that that brings to the Blender 4.0 update. First and foremost, I think the current version of the principal BSDF node has always had a huge energy conservation issue. One clear example of that can be seen when you increase the roughness value on a glass material. You will see it gets darker really quickly at higher values, meaning it loses the energy relatively faster, which is not how real life glass materials behave I guess. And you could enable the multi-scatter CGX mode in the older version as well to get that physically accurate effect. But it has been known to be a little buggy in the past and overtly heavy on your system and occasionally even generate noisy artifacts in the final renders. So these issues have been addressed in the newer version of the node and the Blender wiki actually says that this mode is now a safe default pick in Blender 4.0 which is great news. Other big changes have been brought into the sheen category of the node. There's now a new sheen roughness slider in the new node and also the sheen tint option is now a color slot. The sheenness, as I like to call it, is now calculated more accurately as it can visibly seen here in the comparison and you get a little more control too through the sheen roughness sliders now. So your cloth materials are definitely gonna get more physically accurate with this new update. And the Velvet BSDF node is now replaced with the Sheen BSDF node, which comes now with a new microfiber option. So even that's a plus for your cloth materials. The old node also apparently had a lot of issues with inaccurate metallic Fresnel, and even overall Fresnel was strange as it states here on the wiki and a lot of other issues that are mentioned here too. And I don't think all of them have been addressed in the new node here in the 4.0 alpha version right now because I couldn't see any visible difference here on my end. So I'll keep an eye out for any progress that happens here and keep you guys updated as well. But let's now move on to the next thing, which is also an update slash tip along the same line, that being a big issue with a very commonly used node in Blender. I think most of you might have already witnessed this in some shape or form in your projects. Basically, the normal node in the shader editor is kind of wacky. It kind of loses its mind when you try to go above a value of 1 in the strength field. And this was noticed by the 16 year old Blender Math Wiz Nugget here on Twitter. I guess not Twitter anymore i think i need to say nugget here on x which is just weird to say but anyway nugget not only pointed out the issue but provided a solution for it too for free here on his handle and it already is scheduled to be implemented by default in blender 4.0 but just in case you are impatient you can follow the note setup here from this post that i will link in the description once you do you will clearly see the normal maps are not doing that weird thing anymore they used to do before when you increase the strength above one and it doesn't just fix upper values it also helped implement negative normal maps by going below zero so that's a great addition as well so yeah huge props to hot dog nugget firstly for a crazy good username right and then to his contribution to a widely used yet broken node in the shader editor so let's move on to the next tip which kind of bothers me that people don't use it enough in their workflow which is the object info node and specifically the random slot in it i'm sure you've heard about it a thousand times by now so i'm just here to give you a reminder about it and a very helpful use case i found for it i usually use it on foliage that i want to spread around manually but don't want it all to look too similar so i just put a hue saturation node in front of the main texture and then drive the saturation value through this random slot or you can use a color ramp in between them or a map range node as i have here for a little extra control and I set it up so it very subtly changes the saturation and value of the grass every time I duplicate it hence making the grass look not way too uniform. On top of that if you add this geometry node setup that I copied from the stack exchange post that helps rotate the object a little bit every time it's duplicated and moved a little bit that helps increase the randomness even more. So I love using the object info node whenever I can and I hope I have encouraged you to use it too in your projects. Okay, let's move on to the next tip that kind of confused me when I first heard about it. I think you must have noticed that Blender has been supporting .psd files for image textures for a long time now. I didn't really get why someone would want to use a 21 MB file instead of a 3 MB PNG file, but I'm kind of dumb and I'm sure this tip is no shocker at all to most of you watching, but here it goes anyway. So if you have a texture as a PSD file, you can easily make changes in the texture map here in Photoshop and then quickly save that PSD file. And then here in Blender, you refresh the texture and it's immediately there right in front of you. And I know it's not a huge deal because all you had to do was export the image here from Photoshop and overwrite the older image. But you get what I'm trying to say here, right? You are saving maybe a few seconds, but to me, even that is a lot sometimes, especially in situations where I know I'll be altering the texture a lot throughout the project. So yeah, I hope this helps a tiny fraction of the audience who are equal as dumb as I am. 
And hey, while we're talking about making quick alterations, here's another tip. Why not use this object field in the texture coordinate node and attach an empty here. So you always have a controller right in front of you here in the viewport. And if you have a situation like I had in this scene where I knew I'd want to try different angles here for the wooden floor, this pinned empty controller comes really handy to make some very quick changes and try out different sizes and angles for the texture without ever leaving the 3D workspace. Isn't that kind of nice? So definitely try it out sometime. And while we're in this scene, let's also talk about vertex paint for a little while. Another feature that I sometimes absolutely forget exists in Blender but can be really useful for a lot of shading purposes. It's now part of the sculpt mode and is accessed using this specific paint brush here in the sculpt mode. I suggest you create some color palettes here and paint to your heart's content and you don't even have to be good at it because you can later use this smudge brush to hide all the crap that you smeared on your model and it just instantly makes it pretty. It's one of those features that seems like only professionals use, but I would suggest you give it a swing when you can. It's a fun time, especially on a stylized model like this. So give it a try. That's all I ask of you. Just give it a try once and thank me later. Now before we move on, I would like to take a few seconds and talk about today's sponsor Squarespace. Now I've said this before and I'll say it again, if you are looking to make your own website, be it for an online store or a portfolio showcase or maybe just for a simple blog, Squarespace is the best choice out there. They have countless templates for any niche you can think of, all powered by their new Fluid Engine, which is their new drag and drop editor that makes customizing these templates a breeze. And it doesn't matter if you know how to code, it doesn't matter if you are a tech savvy person or not, Squarespace has made it all absolutely easy for anyone to pick up and get started in seconds. So head on to squarespace.com and try it all out for free for yourself. And once you are ready to launch your website, go to squarespace.com slash stash to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. So go check them out before the deal runs out. All right, let's move on. Let's talk about another thing we all know about and I've heard about a thousand times, but sometimes forget that this avenue exists, which is using simple projection mapping techniques. Sometimes all you need is just one single image that works as a reference for modeling and also works as a texture for that model. I guess sometimes you don't have to spend several hours looking for thousands of photo references for a model and several PBR textures to texture it. Sometimes just a single image is enough, I guess. And you run that image through this free add-on called Deep Bump and you can get some really good normal maps and height maps too. And most of the time you don't even need to do that. Just a color ramp from the same image is more than enough for roughness and bump sometimes. So yeah, if you are in the middle of a project, maybe this was just a nice little reminder that this avenue does exist, maybe for your ongoing project. But let's move on to the next thing, which is about creating procedural masks for your models. And I'll be honest, this topic did kind of scare me in the past because all the tutorials I watched regarding this topic were kind of complex. For me at least, because I can barely digest a node tree with more than three or four nodes. And what I realized is most of these masks don't even require very complex node trees. So for an example, for an edge mask, all you gotta do is subtract two bevel nodes. One of them needs to have zero radius and one of them needs to have a slightly higher radius. And that's it, you plug that into a color ramp and you've got your a pretty decent edge mask I think. And now you can plug any grunge map or scratch map into the radius of the upper node to add some scratchiness in the mask too, if you want. And for a curvature map, which if you don't know just measures the convexity or concavity of a model, can literally just be a pointiness node driven through a color ramp node. And that's it. It's not perfect, but for us lazy 3D generalists, this is more than enough, really, in most cases. And on top of that, we can even add an ambient occlusion mask, which is again just the ambient occlusion node with a color ramp. And you've got yourself some nice contact shadows for the model too now. What else do you need? And you know what? What's funny is you don't even have to go through all this trouble sometimes. I'm gonna be honest, I sometimes completely forget that you could just make a new custom texture map right here and just paint a texture map yourself. You can then add scratches or a cloud texture mask over it here in the texturing panel and just paint away. And then you don't even need to rely on any of these finicky procedural masks anymore. So yeah, don't forget this route exists too if procedural textures scare you sometimes. But let's continue riding this train of forgetting important shading tips and tricks and talk about the easiest way you can add some details into your textures, which is through decals. I don't know how I keep forgetting that decals exist and that I can just add a bunch of leak and grunge decals to my scene and take it to the next level without ever touching the shader editor. How handy is that? So yeah, don't forget about decals either. I also sometimes forget that the subsurface field is not just for human skin. You can use it anywhere you like. Like here in this mini keyboard, almost everything you see here has a bit of subsurface added to it. And I feel like that's what's really giving this render its iconic look. The buttons feel really squishy and I want to press them. And I think that's all thanks to the subsurface field. So yeah, don't forget about that either. 
And don't forget about trying the different subsurface modes here from this drop down too. Random walk usually gives the best results, but give the other two methods a whiff too sometimes. They can be surprisingly good for different lighting scenarios. Now the last thing on this forgetting important fields list for me is me forgetting to set the right IOR values for the different materials in my scene. Again, it's not usually a big change visually, but it can be in different lighting scenarios. So find the right IOR values for your different materials and set it up as soon as you can, just so you are on the safer side. And lastly, the only tip I have left for you now is to remind you to use the layer weight node in your emission shaders. I think Ducky has said it a thousand times already in his video, so I am just here to reiterate it. Use a layer weight node with your emission shaders to give them that nice gradient effect and avoid that flat and ugly looking emission effect you get by default. You can even add a grunge map to the radius of the layer weight node to get an even cooler effect if you want. So keep that in mind for your future emission materials. And I guess that's it. These are the tips I had in mind for this video. And if at this point you are thinking that this is just all too much for you to remember and you would just prefer some pre-made materials, here's a list of my favorite Blender material libraries. Top on that list will always be the Blender Kit add-on. It's free and has just a crazy amount of materials available for you. More than enough to suffice all your material needs in all your projects, so definitely check them out. If not them, then you always have the Polyhaven website and the Ambient CG website for some free PBR textures. Don't forget about the free version of the real-time materials add-on by Ducky, nor the free version of the Sanctus library materials. Both of them are packed with really useful and powerful procedural materials, so keep them in mind as well. Same goes for the free version of the Polygon add-on. They are constantly adding more and more free materials to their library, so don't forget to check them out as well. And while you're at it, also download the community material pack made available by Curtis Holt for some more free materials. All of them just amazing libraries, just packed with amazing niche materials. So give all of them a try, I promise you won't be disappointed. And before we end the video, check out some links in the description for some paid add-ons and resources that I know will come in handy in your shading and texturing workflow if you are ready to spend a few bucks. Add-ons like PBR Painter and Fluent Materializer enable a substance painter-like workflow within Blender, which can be really useful if you can't afford the absurd Adobe pricing plans but are okay with spending some money on a single perpetual license. There's also add-ons like Quick Texture made available by Jama Jurubev's Gumroad that enables some crazy shortcuts that will allow you to do almost everything you can in the shader editor without ever leaving your 3D viewport. So you can check that out as well. And I've also linked some of my favorite imperfection and grunge and roughness maps so you can even delve into that if you want. But yeah, I think that's it. That's all I had planned for this video. Thanks for watching till the end if you did and I'll hopefully catch you guys in the next video. Bye-bye.